what theologians think is a very, very early hymn or a song that the early church used to sing about Jesus. And it's found in the book of Colossians. And I want you to think of this as a song. Like sometimes you read words and you can't really hear the melody. But I want you to imagine that they actually had music to these words that we're about to read. It says about Jesus. It says, He, Jesus, is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God, and the firstborn heir of all creation. For through the Son, everything was created, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth, all that is seen and all that is unseen. Every seat of power, realm of government, principality and authority, it was all created through Him and for His purpose. Jesus existed before anything was made, and now everything finds completion in Him. He is the head of His body, which is the church. And since He is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, He is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all His fullness dwelling in Christ, and by the blood of His cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to Himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. This hymn or this song that is being declared or sung about Christ, it starts off with a phrase, obviously we're singing it in English, but in, in, in the, the phrase, the very first phrase it says, He is the divine portrait. Other translations say, He is the, the, the visible image of an invisible God. He's the divine portrait. He's the one that came to show us the things that we previously could not see. He came, Christ came to give us a clearer representation of what God really looked like. I like to say it this way. If you ever question what God looks like, just read the stories of Jesus and you'll see Him. <laughs> read the way that Jesus interacted with people and you will see the image of God becoming alive in your life. That's why we love to read the stories of Jesus over and over because every single time we get a clear picture of what God looks like. But in this, in this song, we see at the very end this profound statement, and this is, this is at the crux of what we will be talking about as we talk about God being the God of much more. He says at the end of this, of this closing stanza of the song, he says that, that God brought everything back to himself. Everything in heaven and earth, everything was brought back to God through Christ. Everything was brought back to him, and then it says he was brought back to its original intent. Restored to innocence again. It's a crazy thought when you think about the fact that one of the things that you hear me talk about over and over as we read scripture is the fact that God wants to make you brand new. He doesn't want to just rehash you. He doesn't want to just improve you a little bit. He doesn't want to just fix you up and just give you a makeover. God wants to make you brand new. Amen. And what that literally means is that through faith in Christ, your innocence can be restored. Innocence can be given back to you again. You can once again reclaim the original intent of your Creator. Amen. That He gave you innocence. Now, every one of us can attest to the fact that we are not innocent. There isn't an innocent person in this room tonight. Every one of us has done things wrong, and every one of us has dirtied our hands in many ways and shapes and forms. But to be able to believe once again that spiritually speaking, God wants for us to believe about ourselves what He declares to be true, that He makes us innocent. Every broken law, every sin violated, everything that we've done that we knew was not the right thing to do. God says, I have made provision for every one of those things. And through the covenant that I have made, through the sacrifice that I have given, through the life that I lived on your behalf, you can be made innocent again and actually begin to feel that way. I don't know if any of you guys have ever felt that feeling of just the... The thought of being refreshed spiritually. Amen. 
Amen. One of the things, we just had people come up to these altars and receive prayer. And I have been a recipient of coming to the altar of God my whole life. And I can tell you that I can stand here and attest to, to you of the, the, the physical feeling of feeling God's cleansing power in my life. Right. Receiving prayer from somebody and walking away from the altar or walking away from an interaction with another believer and just feeling like, wow. God totally just washed me, and I feel refreshed, and I feel renewed, and I feel made clean again. The truth is that God wants for us to begin to tap into something that will give us the fuel to believe that He's not done in our lives, but He is expanding things more and more and more. And a big part of it is how we view ourselves when it comes to sin and when it comes to the way that God sees us. I want to take you back to the book of Exodus tonight to a story that, uh, that is found on the journey that, that the children of Israel are in the middle of, really. And it's the story of Moses that we've come to love and tell many times over. The story of God picking a man who was not the right man for a job that was a big job. And God calling this man named Moses and raising him up and then giving Moses what he needed to become a leader in the lives of God's people. And God told this man, Moses, I'm going to raise you up and I'm going to make you my mouthpiece and my leader and my prophet to lead the children of Israel out of slavery and towards a, a destination that ultimately will be a fulfillment of a promise that God says I made to them long ago. And God says, I'm going to take them to the place where they belong. God had a place for his people to belong. And he brought Moses into the story to help facilitate the journey to get from here, a place they didn't belong, to there, the place that they did belong. Amen. And so in the middle of this process of getting from here to there, there's a lot of drama that unfolds. And if you read the book of Exodus, you will find all of the drama that happens as these people begin to follow this man Moses through the journey of what the Bible says is the wilderness we would call it modern day through the jungle or through a forest or through no man's land. But they're going through this wilderness experience. And God began to teach Moses many, many, many things about how to lead these people. And God began to give Moses very clear instructions about how to be a good leader. And there were some things that God did with Moses that were very, very special. And I want to share one of those interactions with you tonight. It's found in Exodus 33, and it starts in verse 7. It says, It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and they would stand in the entrances of their own tents, and they would watch Moses. Till he disappeared inside. As he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And afterward, Moses would return to the camp. But the young man who assisted him, named Joshua, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You've told me, I know you by name and I look favorably on you. Well, if it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied and he said, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. And then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. And the Lord replied to Moses and he said, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you. 
and I know you by name. In this story, there's some parts of this story that you have to use your imagination to really fully, you know, kind of understand. Sometimes I wish the Bible was like a, a Netflix documentary or something, you know, where they could just make everything so vivid that you could see it. Actually, there was a great series, the Bible, not too long ago. I should watch that again. Anyway, the, the stories of Scripture sometimes need to come to life inside your mind for you to fully understand what's going on. And this is definitely one of those situations. See, this story tells a very, very interesting fact, but one that many of us have a hard time relating to. The story reveals that God did not talk to people personally like He does with us now. The story tells of a different time and a different era when people, if they wanted to have a relationship with God, they had to go to a person that was the appointed or designated person that God put in place. Their relationship with God was always secondhand information. It's, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that because I can come to the altar of the Lord and I can cry out to God and I know He hears me and I hear Him too, despite what they might say on TV, that I may be mentally ill or whatever they're throwing out there if I hear God's voice. But these people couldn't. If they wanted to hear a word from God or a message from God, they had to look to this guy, Moses, and they had to say, Moses, what does God have to say for my life? Moses, what should I do? What would God have me do? So this dynamic, I don't know about you, but for me, here's my imagination again, I would not envy Moses at all. How would you like to have all of these people coming to you all the time going, Moses, I'm struggling with my marriage. What should I do about this woman that I have? Like, what does God want me to do? That dude had to be the busiest guy on the planet, man. People coming to him going, tell me what God wants me to do all the time. These people would watch this dynamic play out. Last month, we were talking about how God in this story met people where they were at. And how God told them, I want you to know that I'm with you all the time. And so I'm going to make it easy on you. God said, I'm going to establish myself in a pillar of a cloud. So when you see this pillar of cloud, you know I'm here with you. And God said, I want you to know I'm with you even at nighttime when you're sleeping. So at nighttime, you're going to see a pillar of fire in the sky glowing. And you're going to know God is with you. And so now we read the story that... Moses had a special place that he would go, the tent of meeting, <clears throat> his prayer place. He would go to this tent, and the cloud would hover in front of it. What did that communicate to all the people that were watching? God is meeting with Moses. There's some spiritual business being taken care of in this meeting right now in this tent. And the story says they would all sit there, and they would bow down, and they would watch. They would watch this interaction between God and Moses. It's a crazy thing to, wrap, to try to wrap your head around. But this picture that we see in this story, it, it's not just a picture for us to observe and go, wow, that's interesting. It's a picture that tells of a day that would come that is here right now. The picture would foretell a time when God's presence would no longer just be at a specific place in front of a tent, but it's a place, it's a picture of a place where God says, someday you will experience my presence all the time in your life and have access to me yourself. God was modeling that at his heart, God wanted to intimately be with his people. Moses, we would say, was an elite he was, he was hand-picked. He was not like everybody else. Moses had a specific job. And Moses talked to God in such a way that models for us how we too can talk to God. Moses didn't pull any punches. There's another place in the story where God actually refers to Moses as his friend. It says Moses was a friend of God. Do you realize that Moses is in this tent right now and he's having a supernatural encounter with the holy presence of God? And you know what he says to, you know what he says to God? He's like, God, what's going on? 
You tell me, take these people over there, but I don't even know how to get over there. I don't know who's going to go with me. I need help. God and Moses have a real life dialogue that's going on about real life concerns in Moses' life. Moses is not speaking softly. Lord, may I speak? I don't want to say the wrong thing so you might be dead. Moses is speaking freely to God. And he's modeling for us that God wants for you to speak freely to him as well. And you know what God is doing back in this encounter? He's talking freely to Moses. Moses says something to him. He says, he says, or God says to Moses personally, he says, Moses, I've heard you. And he says, I want you to know something. Everywhere I'm sending you to go, I will personally go with you there. Amen. And then he says, I will give you rest and everything will be fine for you. What a promise. What a promise to hear God literally say to you, everything will be fine for you. I will go with you and I will give you my rest and everything will be fine in your life. You know, that promise wasn't just for Moses. That promise is for you tonight. That when you come into a relationship with the living God and you begin to bring your concerns to him like Moses did, you know what you're going to hear God say to you? I will personally go with you and I will give you my rest. Everything will be fine for you. In this story, Moses makes a profound statement that I want to zero in on tonight. He says to God, he says, God, if you don't go with us, nothing's going to work. He says, because your presence with us is what sets your people apart from everybody else in the world. It's not that we do things different. It's not that we look different or we talk different. The thing that sets us apart, Moses said to God, is your presence here with us. God being with his people is the distinctive difference from everybody else in the world. When you come in contact with somebody who knows that God is with them and carries the presence of God with them, it changes and it sets them apart from every other person in the situation. It's invisible. It's unseen. It's something that you can't wrap your head around or that you can't put your finger on. And yet the presence of God, just as Moses said then, is the same now. And I want you to know that the presence of God is not something that is just in this story but that we can experience the presence of God every day. Every day the presence of God can be experienced. That we can learn to walk in a place in our life where we learn to understand and we learn how to have access to the very presence of God. How can I say that? Well, I want to share with you quickly the story that backs up what I'm saying. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 2. It says on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on top of each of them. Everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. <clears throat> How can this be? These people are all from Galilee and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, all these different places. And we hear all these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there and they were amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. In this story, we find a fulfillment of what Jesus had told his followers was going to happen. He told them on his final moments on earth. I want you to gather together and I want you to go and I want you to wait because the Father has a gift for you. It's a promise. You can count on it. And I want you to wait until He gives you the gift that is coming. And that gift was something 
that the people back in the wilderness that were watching Moses go into this tent and experience an encounter with God, those people could not have that same encounter with God. Those people were missing out on the relationship that Moses experienced with God because everything that they had was secondhand information. Everything that they had was not direct enough. It was not clear enough. As a matter of fact, their picture of God was fuzzy and it didn't have the detail that God wanted for them to have. And so Jesus came and He is the divine portrait of the invisible God. He came to clarify everything so that people could see who God is in their own way and understand and relate. Jesus said, wait for me, wait for the filling of the Spirit to come because this gift will be poured out. And as these believers gather together in this room, it says there was about a group of people about the size of, of how many are here tonight. And we gathered together as they gathered together back then. And they waited. They waited for God to give them what God had promised them. And God did. And the pouring of the Spirit of God came upon them in such a way that they began to literally manifest His Spirit through their lives. Miracles started to take place. It didn't end in this one-time encounter. They went out into the streets and they began to encounter people. They began to preach with new power and with new boldness and with new understanding of the Scriptures and what Jesus had taught them before He left. They began to model and live this experience of what it means to be full of God's Spirit. And one of the very first things that we see that takes place as a result of this outpouring is that Peter begins to preach this message and people begin to come around and they're like, what is going on? They begin to hear things happening that they can't wrap their head around. They don't understand what they're hearing because these these. Foreigners are gathered in Jerusalem. They've come from all the different lands and nations, and they speak different languages. And they come together, and all of a sudden they begin hearing their native languages being spoken. And they're like, what is happening? Why am I hearing my native tongue, my native language being spoken? And the things that I'm hearing being said are glorifying God and telling about how the great things that God has done. I don't know if you could... Use your imagination for a second, but you know, our world is full of so many different people groups and different languages. Just for imagine, just imagine for a moment that every single one of us came from a different nation. That in this room right now, we had people that spoke the native tongue of, you know, the, 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 the different continents of, of Africa and of Central America. I know some of you guys are bilingual and can speak Espanol. Me, un poquito. Taco, that's it. Some of you can speak the, some of you can speak the native tongue of lasagna, Italian. Some of you can, I don't know. But I want you to think for a moment with me. What would it be like right here, right now, if every one of us spoke a different language? The communication in this room would be hilarious. We would be trying to, you know, do what we do if you've ever traveled. And you're trying to you know, point to things, you're trying to do charades, you're trying to do all these things. And all of a sudden, this group of people who have all been in Jerusalem for a very specific reason, they've all gathered for a specific reason, all of a sudden they all begin to hear, wait a second, I understand what's being said. Wait a second, that, I'm hearing things being spoken in my own language. Wait a second, I don't understand. How, how is this happening? What do you think what do you think the question would be that would erupt in this room? Perplexed? Why is this happening? The question that they ask themselves, what does this mean? What is going on? What does this mean? What in the world is happening? Peter steps up and he addresses their questions and he begins to preach to the Jews that were there, and he says, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Just make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. No, what you see was predicted long ago 
by the prophet Joel. He steps up and he says, you are witnessing something that has been laying on the shelf of God for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years waiting for the right time for him to pull it off the shelf and to pour it out over humankind. He says, what you're seeing right now is not people being weird. What you're seeing right now is not an accident. What you're seeing right now is a prophecy being made true right in front of your eyes. And then he says the words of the prophecy that the prophet Joel spoke. He said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. He says, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter steps up and he begins to turn the page of the story of God. He says, let me turn the page and let me show you that we have just stepped into what we have been being prepared for. See, the journey that the people were on in the wilderness, as Moses was leading them through the wilderness, it mirrors the story and the journey that God is bringing his people on here and now. See, it wasn't just a journey of them getting from, from Egypt into Canaan to the promised land. It was a journey for us to look at to see that the day would come when God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. And in that day, which is this day, by the way, in this day, as the Spirit of God has been freely released to move across our world and to move in and through God's people, the Spirit of God now fills His sons and daughters. And do you know that within you right now, if you're old, God's given you the power to dream again. If you're young, God says, I put within you the very power to have visions for the future of things that have never happened in your life. He says, my sons and daughters will prophesy for me. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a prophet? Remember Moses? You remember what Moses' job was? Moses went before God. He went and got in the meeting tent, and then he said, God, give me the message. And then he would go out and he would tell the people, here's the message from God. Do you realize that God's heart has always been, I want every one of my sons and daughters to be my messenger. I want everyone who is full of my spirit to carry my message. Do you realize that every morning you have the opportunity to go to your own tent of meeting? Do you have the opportunity every morning to go and get before God and say, God, give me the message today for whoever I come in contact with. God, give me the message of whoever I'm going to encounter that needs to hear what you want to say to them. And God says, you be my prophet. Let me prophesy through you. Let me use your mouth. Let me use your intellect. Let me use you. I don't care what state your life is in. He doesn't leave anybody out. Young, old, men, women, rich, poor. He says, every one of them, when my spirit goes out, is going to be affected. There's only one thing that is preventing it from happening in your life right now. The closing sentence of that prophecy spoken so long ago. <clears throat> he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you called on the name of the Lord? Because that is the only prerequisite to what I'm talking about tonight. For you to be able to call on the name of the Lord and receive the salvation that He freely offers that He freely gives, that this table right here represents the covenant of God, the new covenant of Jesus made available through His life for yours. See, when we call on the name of the Lord, the Bible says over and over in many places that we will find what we're calling for. God help! Anybody else ever said that one? God help! Please, God help! Do you realize that that is not a cry in vain? It's not a cry in vain. God help is one of the deepest, most profound prayers that you could ever offer to God. God help. I don't know what to do, God, but here I am. Help. 
God, please come and invade my space. See, this whole thing that we're talking about tonight is pointing to this truth that God is the God of much more. And some of you, like me, maybe have been doing this for a while, and I lived for many, many years thinking that I had God figured out. I had it all dialed in. I knew what to do. My routine was intact. I was, this is what we do, and this is it, and God does this, and this is I had it all dialed in. I know, I'm so grateful that one day God came through like a wrecking ball. And he just said, let me show you what you don't know about me. And I still don't have a clue now. That was over 10 years ago. Because when we come to a place to where we say, God, I just want more of you. He begins to say, let me show you a few things. And it starts with his presence. See, if you're here tonight and you're saying, I don't know what to do, I got the answer. Get in his presence. If you're here tonight and you're just like, man, I'm struggling in my flesh. Temptation is getting me and I can't say no to the things that come across my path. I have the answer for you. Get in his presence. Every day, find time in his presence. It is not far away. You do not have to go to the tent of meeting and you do not need some secondhand person to bring it to you. You can experience his presence on the daily, every second of your life. Because the word of God says that he dwells within us now. He's no longer content to just hang out in a tent pitched by men. He says, I want to be in and with my people all the time. This is the hope and this is the promise. <clears throat> and this is why I can say with confidence that if you're a liar, God's going to teach you how to tell the truth. That if you are a manipulator, God's going to teach you how to stop. That if you're somebody who is ashamed of yourself, God's going to remove every ounce of shame and guilt that you feel right now. Amen. And if you're a person who has lost all hope because of your track record and the things that you've done, God is going to fill you with hope. He's going to give you a vision for your future. Amen. Because God is the God of much more That's than right. what you have right here, right now. Amen. And when we begin to believe that and step towards that, our transformation is the, the very foundation of being able to experience that. If you're here tonight and you want to step across the line, so to speak, I know it's not a real line, but the line of faith, to step across and say, you know what, Jesus, I want in, I want to be counted as yours. I am not here tonight to sell you something. I'm not here tonight to give you a sales pitch of any shape or form. I'm not here tonight to offer you something that's easy. I'm here to offer you something tonight that is more than just a try God out kind of a moment. I'm here to tell you that without Christ in your life, you're not living at all. That He did not come to make you better. He came to make you come alive. Amen. And there's a difference. And if you believe that your life that you have lived up to this point is not real life, you can step across the line tonight and you can call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And you can come and you can join with me and the, the others that will come in just a moment to these tables and you can say, Jesus, thank you for dying. Thank you for shedding your blood and thank you for letting your body be dismantled for me. Thank you for making a new covenant on my behalf that made way for me to never ever again have to go through the tent with somebody else doing the work for me. But now I can come directly to the Father because of what you did, Jesus. And thank you for sending the gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to infill me and power me and give me every spiritual gift that I need to do what you asked me to do. God, thank you for the life that you've given to me. Close your eyes. Let's pray.